What's up, YouTube? This is Two Off of TV. As always, I want to remind you guys that if you want to show love to this channel, if you want to donate to this channel, you can do so on the link provided in the description box below. And I want to thank Jason for his donation to the channel. I really appreciate it, Jason, man. You've always been a big supporter of my channel, man. And um, we're going to go on to bigger and better things on this channel. Now, let's talk about Ryan Hollins, right? He was on ESPN First Take. And um, it was he, Shaquille O'Neal, Max Kellerman, and Molly Kerum. And um, Ryan Hollins, everybody pretty much knows that he's pretty much, he wants that title as the biggest LeBron James jock snapper. Jock snapper. Uh, jock snapper. <laughs> Biggest jock sniff in the world, man. That nigga Ryan Hollins is the biggest LeBron James jock sniffer I've only ever seen, man. Nah, but uh, he wants that title, man. And I, I, I sometimes don't know. I, I, I do believe that he believes what he's saying. But I think he exaggerates a little bit. And, um, he comes across to me as a bit of an old school hater. Like, he's one of those guys that thinks that everything that's happened in the last 10 years is infinitely superior to anything that happened before. He's one of those guys. You know what I'm saying? That, that to me, he's one of those dudes. And, um... Basically, he was saying that he thinks that neither Kobe Bryant nor Michael Jordan could feel the shoes of LeBron James as far as what he's done and what he's accomplished. He mentioned that Michael Jordan, uh, you know, well, actually, he said that he thinks, what did he say? He said that um, LeBron James has twice as many career assists as Michael, which is inaccurate. Um, I think LeBron has like 8,600 career assists. Michael had 5,600 career assists. So that's 3,000 more assists, but that's not doubling up what Michael's done. Now, not to mention the fact that LeBron's played in 120 something more games than Michael Jordan did. So those things have to be kept into perspective. Also, one has to remember that for his career, Michael Jordan averaged 5.3 assists per game. And in his prime, he averaged better than six assists per game. And, of course, he had that one season where he averaged eight assists per game playing as the point guard during the 88-89 season for the Chicago Bulls. So, basically, what this really is, when you talk about assists, it's predicated more on each individual player's role for their respective teams. LeBron James has infinitely dominated the basketball and the offenses for the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Miami Heat, and then his second stint with Cleveland and going into the Lakers. He dominates the basketball. When you dominate the basketball that much and play point guard at the small forward position, all right, you're going to get a lot of assists. Michael Jordan, on the other hand, especially after Phil Jackson became head coach, started playing more off the ball, did not have the basketball in his hands as much as people want to think he did. Yes, he did have the basketball in ISO situations, but you started seeing Michael bring the ball up less and less often. And Michael playing more off the ball, scoring, uh, you know, in the high post or on the wing or, you know, Basically, that's where you tended to see Michael. You know what I'm saying? Um, also, as a matter of fact, in the second three-peat, Scottie Pippen had the ball in his hands, the actual basketball, more often than Michael Jordan did. And that's one of the reasons why, during the second three-peat, Michael's assists were kind of down. I think the 96 season, he averaged 4.3 assists. And I think the last two seasons was like 3.8 assists per game because he didn't have the basketball in his hands much. And his role was pretty much to get into the block and score. 
that 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 was Michael's uh, role on that team was to score and score quickly and score at an efficient rate. And when he talks about LeBron James um, uh, doing something that they did never they've never done, which go to multiple teams to win championships, well, look, Krim Jabbar is the only player in the Milwaukee Bucks history to lead his team to an NBA title. He did it in 1971, along with help of Oscar Robertson, yes. And again in 1974, he went to the NBA Finals, where he came just short of winning another title to the Boston Celtics. Then, of course, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was traded after the next season to the Lakers, where ultimately he won an additional five NBA championships along with Magic Johnson during the 1980s. The great Will Chamberlain put up unbelievable numbers with the Philadelphia Warriors. All right? What type of numbers I'm talking about? Well, the first, oh, what, four seasons of his career, he averaged 37.6 points per game, 38.4 points per game, an unconscionable 50.4 points per game, and then 44.8 points per game. All right? During the 1961-62 season alone, Will Chamberlain had 45 50-point games that season. 45 50-point games. Now, did he win an NBA championship during that time? No, he didn't. But he went to the Philadelphia 76ers via trade. And during the 1966-67 season, his team won 68 ball games. And in my estimation, I think that might have been the best individual team in the history of the NBA. They won a championship with Will Chamberlain being an all-around player, being a scorer, rebounder, and playmaker and passer. And then ultimately, with the Lakers, he won another title. It was the first title in the history of the Lakers franchise in 1971-72, with a somewhat past his prime, Jerry West, Gail Goodrich, Happy Hairston, uh, Jim, Mc I think his name was Jim McMillan, and various others. Okay? So he's not the first one to win multiple titles with different teams, but he is a tremendously gifted basketball player. But I do not think anymore. I used to believe this, but I no longer believe that LeBron James is a greater player than Kobe Bryant. I do not believe, for instance, that if you put LeBron James on that 2006 roster that Kobe Bryant played with, where he played with such luminaries as Kwame Brown and Slavo Medvedenko, and your best teammate is Lamar Odom. I don't see LeBron James leading that team to 45 victories. No. Even though he's a guy that makes everybody around him better. <laughs> now, my thing about the, the Bulls and the, versus the Warriors, it's all speculative. We don't really know who's going to win that matchup. But I think what pisses off some people around Hollins is how smug he is about how easy a victory will be for the Warriors, which I don't see especially if you're playing by the 1990s rules. You're playing by the 1990 rules with hand-checking and all of that, no free movement rule to help out offensive players. The paint clogged up, you know what I'm saying? Um, I see this. Kevin Durant is going to be the X factor. If Kevin Durant's really going, the Warriors might beat Chicago. For the Chicago Bulls, the X factor to me would probably be, as it often was, Scottie Pippen. If Scottie Pippen can have an, a great offensive series and if he can contain Kevin Durant enough, then I think the Chicago Bulls win. Um, but in this, in that era... The 90s, I think 
Steph Curry suffers the most. He's not going to have the spacing to get his shot off that he's accustomed to because of the hand checking rules. You know what I'm saying? He's not going to be able to square up the way he wants to. He's going to have his back to the opponent more often. And that's going to frustrate Curry. And um, the physicality of the, of the of that era will affect him. Klay Thompson is a beast. Don't get me wrong. Klay Thompson is a very competitive guy. He's a go. He he he's, he he'll go hard for his team. But I think that that era would hurt him too. He's a catch and shoot guy. And don't get me wrong. Catch and shoot players can have some success against the Chicago Bulls. Ask Reggie Miller. Um, but how many times did Reggie Miller really light Chicago up for 30 points, 35 points, 40 points? Not that often. To me, Clay going to have to work really hard to get his shot off. It's not just going to be the situation where – um, he's going to be, I mean, he could catch and shoot, but it's going to be further out, you know, like 30 feet, 27 feet, which he can hit, but it's not going to be easy task for him. Plus he's going to have to be on the defensive end. He's going to have to be guarding Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Um, and I see by game three fatigue starting to set in for Clay Thompson, and of course we all know that fatigue uh, affects the outside shot the first. So I can see Clay Thompson starting to struggle with his outside shot. Dennis Robbins going to own the boards. I don't know what the fuck Ryan Hunt's talking about. Draymond Green's going to out rebound Dennis Robbins. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about with that shit. You know what I'm saying? And um, Demarcus Cousins would probably. Let me think about this one. The Marcus Cousins versus Luke Longley. That's my, you know, the Marcus Cousins is act. You know, obviously he's better than Luke Longley, but you know the Chicago Bulls don't want to. They they really don't expect too much out of Luke Longley in this series. You know, just give him eight eight points, nine points per game. And the bulk of the offense is going to be handled by, you know what I'm saying, uh, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and maybe to an extent, come off the bench, Tony Kukoc. And um, that's the thing, too. Ryan Hollins keep harping about the starters, which is the Warriors' greatest strength. But aside from some success in the playoffs, their bench is not that great, and we saw that. Chicago's bench was great, and that could be the difference factor in the in a series with those two. Chicago's bench, led by guys like Randy Brown, uh, Tony Kukoc, uh, Bison Dele, may he rest in peace, a.k.a. Brian Williams. That bench is going to put a, a fucking hurting on the Warriors bench. You know what I'm saying? And um, ultimately, I see the Chicago Bulls beating the Golden State Warriors, something like four games to two back in the 90s rules. I see Michael Jordan having a great series. You know what I'm saying? Um I, I don't know. I, I, it's speculative, but I, I, I think the Bulls eke it out. Um, and I want to say this in closing, too. LeBron James is a great basketball player. He really is. Um, but to suggest that he is so great. He's accomplished so much that um, he's leapfrogged not only the, the, the greatest players, but to the point where it's not even a debate. 
I mean, I don't know what world you look, what world you living in. What world are you living in? Like, I can't imagine Michael Jordan being punked by J.J. Barrera, an ancient Jason Kidd, uh, Deshaun Stevenson in the finals. I can't see that. I can't see uh, Kobe Bryant pretty much quitting and accepting uh, a loss of that magnitude by the, against the Warriors to the point where you congratulate them on Instagram for winning I, I, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Bill Russell, okay, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Zeke, Isaiah Thomas. These guys had a totally different mindset than a guy like LeBron James. It's the mentality that separates LeBron James from the other all-time greats. Most of the top 10 all-time greats, to some extent, were alpha males. LeBron James is not an alpha male.